Day 993 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 712,000 military personnel losses included with a whoppingly back-breaking and absolutely staggering record-breaking 1950 personnel losses in the past 24-hour reporting period alone. As Russia's army has doubled down with quite a number of infantry wave attacks in most directions, as part of their unyielding offensive activities amid the increasingly non-ideal and unstable ground conditions leading into the winter. So this day-over-day record-breaking entry is made largely possible through the Kursk activities that we'll take a look at in a moment. But it's also the Kurikovas, the Pokrovsks, the Kupiansk, the Bobchansk, the Turetsks and Shasivyars, the Velika Novosilkas and the Kraminas. Really to name just a few directions of intense combat without my even having mentioned anything related to the entirety of the Kherson or the Zaporizhia regions on the above rattled off list. Then taking a look at Russian hardware, which had an uptick in losses at a commensurate rate, though far from record breaking. And even for the armoured fighting vehicles at a whopping 81 losses, which are of course used to assist in the carrying of Russian infantry waves to front lines of the war, so directly headed into the map now, where the Ukrainian military from the 225th Separate Assault Battalion reported another failed Russian offensive in the Kursk region, with five attack attempts repelled on Novovinovka, involving 29 Russian armoured vehicles at the single pinpoint location on this map, of which about 18 were destroyed. So the columns of the Russian armoured vehicles repeatedly tried to storm Ukrainian positions, only to be met with fierce resistance resulting in burning wrecks and relentless drone strikes. As a result of this location alone, an estimated 300 Russian military personnel losses occurred, marking quite the significant setback. Now, the Ukrainian 225th said of it, quote, the Russians storm in columns one after another, Along the same road, they stick and we destroy them. Armoured cans burn out of the road, where drones and mortars catch up with those who have run across the countryside. Then finishing off with saying, and that's four laps for today. So it appears that quote actually came before, just before the fifth and final failed attempt for the day. It's just astounding that they continue to sustain these losses, yet continue bringing in more equipment. It lacks intelligence, and I don't mean that as some sort of an off-the-cuff insult, but instead that it lacks military intelligence and planning. Which somehow reminds me of the old and adorned military blitzkrieg methodology, of which these Russian assaults, these attempts, were not that at all. But I'm reminded of the blitzkriegs because of the lack of training here. With some of the lesser known negatives or cons of a fast-paced blitzkrieg offensive being that you're sending your most elite, most highly trained soldiers and specialized units into war at the start of the war. And if a blitzkrieg doesn't amount to a total capitulation of the other side in a short space of time, then you have a prolonged war, leading to all of those elite units becoming inherently lost to the start of the war, resulting in the need to train and catch up for the rest of the war with your newly mobilized personnel. So this is where it's at for Russia, and you see this outcome outplay itself within the Russian army, and indeed the wider Russian military. Because it's no longer about training, it's all about numbers. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Kursk region, Russian forces were making an unsuccessful attempt to cross the Sel River, which turned out to be quite the calamity for them. But even if they were successful, good luck supporting those cross-river positions in any meaningful way without losing so much of your army in the process. Then as for Kursk, we've also seen the armed forces of Ukraine with some different tech in the region. Seen here with the unboxing of these Copperhead 155mm laser-guided artillery shells. Now, although artillery has traditionally been an area of attack weapon, 
These advanced munitions can accurately strike moving targets from 16 kilometers or 10 miles away with a powerful 15 pound shape charged warhead onto say an enemy tank for instance. Now these copperheads typically rely on a forward designator to quote unquote paint the target with a laser. For example many decades ago using an F4 phantom jet to do the trick but in the modern era Yep, you guessed it, a copperhead's new best friend is a small quadcopter painting a continuous laser signal on the target for honing purposes of the precision guided munition. So from the point where the laser targeting is in place, the whole event takes about 30 seconds to hit and destroy the target with. Now the copperheads are from the time of the Soviet era, that is to say the 70s and 80s, but more correct to say they are NATO and indeed US munitions from the time of the old Soviet era, with about 20,000 stockpiled since the year 1991, right at the collapse of the Soviet Union. So more recently, here's one example from some weeks ago now where the copperheads were seen in Kursk actually, conducting a precision strike on a Russian antenna mast. But then for Kursk, we also saw more appeals to Putin, seeking his guidance and protection for the over 80% of them that this man says voted for Putin in the last election. In this 20 minute appeal, they ask to go back to Kursk from where they're from and have everything rebuilt. Though an interesting partial admission heard here was how the man said early in the video, quote, Let's not speak about the past and how the evacuation was carried out and how the breakthrough occurred to the Russian territory. But yep, there it is. He's just gone and done it. Spoke about things not to be spoken about in Russia, whether it be Russia's failing military defenses on the border or poorly constructed evacuation procedures. It's almost like a he who must not be named fictional Voldemort character situation where you can't speak ill of the Russian army. Now for this group of people, I'm not saying these are the same Russian people that celebrated on the streets when rockets attacked Ukraine from these Russian border oblasts into Sumy or Kharkiv, but I am fairly overwhelmingly saying that Putin is to blame for these current set of predicaments that these residents face, just in the same way that he is to blame for the predicament of many more Ukrainians. But at the end of the day, only Russian citizens can look in the mirror and accept the true reality of the, the source of their problems. Oh, but back to the Russians dancing in the street footage. Mostly young men there, whereas the demographics seen in this most recent appeal video are very different. With clearly a strong leaning towards females, with very few males and even fewer younger males at that. I'm sure many long since left for the SMO. Then since we're in this region, let's move across to something else on the North Korean component, shall we? As a recent report claims that two North Korean soldiers in Russia died after consuming alcohol-based substances, including antiseptic wipes. The document seen here, allegedly signed by Russian Marine Deputy Commander Alexei Berngard, remains unverified as it circulates online. But there are also additional reports of North Korean alcoholism, which would likely be due to this all of a sudden newfound unfettered access to plenty more of life's little luxuries. Something akin to a kid in a candy store when it comes to these new recruits. So being that there's a great deal of tacit acceptance of alcohol consumption when on the job in the Russian army, and realistically a very pervasive culture of drinking in their army, it's unsurprising that North Korean soldiers are gaining access to all kinds of Russian vodkas, even the Russian bathtub vodkas, which is just another thing that seems to be adding to a growing list of concerns for their introduction. Then headed to Donetsk, which has also been having a strong bearing of its own on the Russian personnel loss counts for the daily updates. With the Russian utilization of meat waves ongoing in the Kurakova direction, certainly playing its part in those statistical affairs. So what we've seen in this direction most recently was the approaching Russian armored columns targeted by Ukrainian forces, specifically the AFU's 33rd Mechanized Brigade in this most recent southeastern frontline position on the map, including a turtle tank seen taken out by a Leopard 2 from its 120mm shells 
Indeed a very active area on the front right now, with in this latest instance about 10 pieces of Russian armor destroyed. Again, pinpointed to one location. Then adjacent to these activities, Russian forces damaged the dam at the Karakova Reservoir, causing flooding in nearby villages in a bit of a dick move, but somewhat expected by Russia's military, likely used as a strategic means to encircle Karakova, which potentially could lead to a pullback of the AFU troops. Though many experienced units are still defending their positions, and we have some older footage, which has shown damage by Russian forces to the dam over the past several months already. Now it's hard to get more information on this as it stands, but a flood wave down the Vovcha River would go west, potentially destroying bridges and used as an attempted means for cutting Ukrainian supply lines. Then further north on the map, another Russian T-90M tank was destroyed on the Pokrovsk front. At this rate, Russia is really pushing them to the front with the limited dozens that they have with Ukraine constantly just chewing them up. I mean, it's fair to say we see this happen two, three times a week at this point. Then extending somewhere east of here, in the village of Orlivka, where Russian armored vehicles, buggies, and infantry transports were again being targeted and destroyed. Because just yesterday, Russians in the nearby town of Semenivka were dealt with the same type of treatment. And it's a very interesting location given that it's not a direct line route to the front really by any means. And you can see that when you zoom in here, where it stands to reason that it's more of a Russian accumulation point found in this area. Then headed further west on the map as Russian state media agency RIA reports that the Ukrainian armed forces are allegedly planning a significant missile strike on the Vasilivka Dam in occupied Zaporizhia. As, well, as they say, every accusation is an admission in the Russian world. So this Russian claim mirrors past accusations, as Russia often projects its own actions onto Ukraine, with, for example, similar uncredible blame placed on Ukrainian forces for the Kakovka Dam explosion, which is right over here from some time ago, resulting in some pretty widespread devastation in Kherson. And it wasn't just an uncredible Russian claim at the time, as it was the Russian army who had the sole access to the southern detonation chambers of the dam. Clearly also used as a defensive mechanism to escape Kherson on the north bank, when they couldn't handle the incoming Ukrainian army. Then taking a look around on the map, as somewhere in the east, a Ukrainian soldier operates a steam deck to control a remote weapons system, targeting Russian forces with precise 762mm fire. So a steam deck is a portable gaming console, in this case set up for firing the 762mm caliber bullets, likely from an MG, although it's not shown in this footage, as the star of the show seems to be the controlling steam deck instead. Then elsewhere, in the undisclosed east, a Russian vehicle encountered a landmine, which seems like a bit of a stock example that I wouldn't normally show. But then on closer inspection, just prior to the event, there was really quite the visible speck on the road, even from the drone perspective we see here. An anti-tank mine or the like, likely dropped right there by a quad or hexicopter drone of the AFU. In other words, it just seems so darn obvious. It's right there. I just can't imagine how it would be missed. It seems to come down to a lack of training once again. The Russians aren't told what to expect on the field and sold this lie of military might of the Russian army. Then also on the map and somewhere in the Russia, as Ukrainian defense intelligence reports that an Mi-24 Russian attack helicopter was burned down in the Moscow region at the Klin-5 airfield on the night of November 10. The destroyed helicopter belonged to the 92nd Squadron of the 344th Center of Combat Application and Retraining of the Air Force of the Russian Federation. But to everybody else, it's just one less Mi-24 attack helicopter at Russia's disposal. Then headed across to some news for today, so Frederick Merz, a candidate for the Chancellor of Germany, declares that if he's elected, noting that a German snap election could be set for next February, 
Then Mertz will issue Putin an ultimatum to end the war in Ukraine within 24 hours. If Russia fails to comply, he plans to supply Ukraine with Taurus missiles and authorize strikes on Russian territory. So that's quite some unexpected and very decisive language from the Chancellor candidate that takes a more aggressive approach than what we've seen with the current Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Scholzy, pulling a Scholz. But to be fair to Scholz, he's authorised quite a bit of defensive military aid, including both the Gepard anti-air systems and IRST air defence systems to Ukraine. But of course, let's not forget the Leopard 2s, the Mars 2 MLRS units, and the PHZ-2000 howitzers. Anything with a 2, basically. Plus the cherry on top of the Marder infantry fighting vehicles. Then looking further internationally, the Norwegian Conservative Party proposes to triple aid to Ukraine in 2025, increasing it from 15 billion to 45 billion kroners. Party leader Erna Sulberg emphasizes the urgent need to support Ukraine's defense amid the ongoing conflict. Oh, and 45 billion kroners worth roughly 4.1 billion US dollars. Then to some across the pond news, where US Congress is currently considering reauthorizing the Lend Lease program for Ukraine, which could provide significant support. The Lend Lease program was originally authorized in May of 2022 to help Ukraine, however, it was set to expire by the end of 2023, and now Congress is considering reauthorizing it to keep providing support until 2026. So it's not a brand new approval, but an extension to the existing program where Lend-Lease allows the US government to lend or lease military equipment to Ukraine under expedited processes and with fewer bureaucratic restrictions. And in this case, Ukraine plans to utilize seized Russian assets to help fund this initiative. Then headed across to some Russian hardware news, as a St. Petersburg court suspends proceedings against two men, Alexander Markov and Dmitry Antipov, who faced charges for smuggling quite a large quantity, 200 kilograms worth of illicit drugs from Peru after they agreed to fight in the war against Ukraine. Did they just get the death sentence? And so my point here is twofold really. Firstly, Russia considers their manpower expendable, which is why I put this news in the Russian hardware update segment. And secondly, if this is what cutting a deal looks like in the Russian legal system these days, showing how this is how people can be held accountable, it doesn't exactly send the right political message inside of Russia that going to the SMO is something that you actually want to do, no matter how hard the Kremlin tries to make it sound like a wonderful experience. Mixed messages right there. And not exactly quality control either, just instant acceptance into the Russian army, which of course is extremely hungry for manpower. It really is a numbers game. Then headed across to a quick Russian economy slash funny to round it all off of today, guys. It's only half a laugh, but here we go. So as the Russian auto industry continues its sanctioned decline, seen with this latest release of a Russian Lada Vesta car, worth the tidy sum of 15,000 US dollars, 1.5 million rubles, that foregoes all the bells and whistles. And it's not just the stereo that you can plainly see missing here. Turns out, it's a veritable death trap as well. No seatbelt height adjustment, no headrest for the middle back seat, and would you believe it, no airbags either. Gee, don't they have any standards in Russia anymore? Well, that's a fair question in any regard, but backsliding automotive standards? You won't see these cars in Europe, or for that matter, probably anywhere else on the planet. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe, support, all of those wonderful things. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.